proudest and hardest thing I've ever done was Pope Joan. Um, the one thing that ben, both Ben and I wanted from Pope Joan was we didn't want it to be the high end of coffee. We didn't want it to be the high end of food. We'd like, we wanted it just to just be like Ian Botham, like a, the best all rounder. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Perhaps the most beautiful feature of a career in hospitality is the ability to travel and find work anywhere on the planet. The ability to adapt and learn new techniques, discover new ingredients, new wines, new ways, and evolve your knowledge. This is also a way to describe the evolution of Australia's culinary landscape. People from all walks of life, all places on earth, weaving a web of creativity and discovering something new within it. Matt Wilkinson is a culinary director of Montalto Winery and creative director of Made from Gin by Four Pillars Gin. Matt, that's quite a mouthful. You're pretty busy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I've, I'm working on a couple of other things as well. I've still got the pie shop at the moment, so it's um, life's a bit busy. Well, you you came from the UK to Australia quite some time ago and made a pretty big impact from a culinary perspective. What made you leave the UK to come to Australia? Um, so a bit of my, my background, I guess I, um, I grew up in a pub. Well, my mum and dad divorced when I was young and my dad ended up, my dad actually worked for Foster's UK. Um, and, uh, he was like the Northern England area manager, uh, during the Hogan years when Foster's, <laughs> Foster's was the number one selling lager. No one drank it in bloody Australia, but everybody drank it in England and they drank a lot of it. Um, so I guess that's was the uh, that's kind of started the Australia thought process. Um, I I I didn't do very well at school. I, I, I loved playing soccer and played to a high level, and ended up uh, not making it at the top end. So I what else would I have? So my dad was um, living in a in a pub. Um, I started working in it. Um, but I actually first started off wanting to be the youngest publican I knew, but I was still 16, so I, had to go. <laughs> so I couldn't drink, let alone serve it, um, which is something I've been doing since I was like you know, 10 years old, uh, working behind the bars. Um, that's, a, that's a different and long story. But um, the, short, the short thing was to – I had to start culinary college. I ended up – um, an amazing, my amazing tutor, uh, John Stevenson. Um, I hated cooking at the start, but um, pushed me to go and uh, work down at his where his son was the sous chef in a little hotel outside of London. Um, and I was supposed to be there for two weeks, just you know, just over Easter. Um, and the old bugger, uh, I was supposed to be put front of house and then one week kitchen but he put me in the kitchen first and I just fell in love with it so I moved from there and then from there up to Scotland and from Scotland I just needed a break we were doing six days big hours bugger all pay and um, I'd got a couple of different jobs around England and um, a job opportunity for Charlie Trotters in Chicago and I decided that I was going to come out to Australia instead and just see how it went um, and in 2000, just as soon as the Olympics have finished, I came out and I'm s still here. Never left. <laughs> <laughs> it, um, it was, it was actually really fun. Like the career element, I was actually supposed to come out and work for, um, uh, the, 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 uh, Mr. Scott, uh, Raymond Capaldi and uh, Gary Megan, at their place in Richmond, um, which, you know, Georgie C worked out. It's quite a big alumni at work there. And anyway, I, I, the day before I was supposed to fly out to Australia, <laughs> to Melbourne, and like I had no idea what I was coming out for. Like I had, I even bought, I even bought a, a guide, right? And I was supposed to back, you know, backpack for a week and then start work straight away. And I was like, yeah, it's fine. Anyway, the a Scottish lad who I'd been working with, uh, Craigie Jenkins, had come over to be uh, the uh, sous chef for Ray. Anyway, he, the day before I got fired, he came back and goes, Matt, don't go and work for that. He's a madman. <laughs> <And> I'm like, <laughs> I'm 25,000 kilometers away from this new restaurant, a new job, and I just worked for a, a Scottish madman uh, who uh, 250 kilometers away. There's no way I was – so I, I, I ended up flying out. 
uh, stopped off in Singapore, and then I my first uh, my first night I stayed at Ridges Hotel. I had like three nights booked in a hotel, uh, which is you know it's not I've got a good stick at the moment with the old COVID. But um, in two thousand, and I uh, I went into the bar that night and hit it off with the barman, but and actually the bar lady. <laughs> she ended up my first girlfriend, <laughs> and. Um, was like next thing I know, I'm working behind the bar and then working at upstairs at Bobby McGee's, which is the um, back then uh, was Monday nights was hospo night and actually Tuesday night was nurses night, which was actually better. And I was making making Maduri illusion shakers, <laughs> <laughs> which which I've got to say is um, something at Four Pillars. I always we always end up drinking is. Maduri, it's, it's the second best drink in the world after uh, Four Pillars Gin. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, in the UK, you were working um, at uh, Michelin star restaurants and then you're doing um, <laughs> Maduri cocktails. When did you first find your foot in the door in a, in a kitchen in Australia? So I, I decided I was going to backpack, and actually, uh, after one of these nights, I ended up buying a one eighty B Datsun for uh, for fifty dollars <laughs> out of an Essendon nightclub, <laughs> and um, we set off to Sydney. Um, and anyway, I got got this one eighty B Datsun to Sydney, uh, left it in Bondi, uh, ran out of money, and then had enough money for uh, the the old bus <laughs> the old bus back to uh back to sydney i'd, I'd had my 21st birthday in sydney uh, and gone oh i've actually did a runner from the the, the the hostel and got back to melbourne and I, I really needed a job and i when i first came to melbourne i bought the good food guide um it was the 2001 um and i made a top 10 list of all the places i wanted to go and work at um, and, you know, uh, throughout that, the top of the list was back then was Donovan Cook and, uh, Philippa Sibley, um, at Estes Des, and their book had been out and I'd seen that in England. And, um, I know Donovan was from, <laughs> I've actually just told him the story about a year ago and he was laughing his head off. Um, he's from Leeds from Yorkshire where I'm from. And anyway, I went there first. It was that day. It was back in you know South Melbourne. Uh, anyway, it was locked to the front. It was this was like January the second, and they were on holidays. But I, well, January the sixth actually, two thousand and one. And I went out the back and I'm looking. Donovan's there, and he politely told me to fuck off and come back tomorrow. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, oh, grumpy bastard, grumpy Yorkshire bastard. Anyway, then I wanted to work at. Um, oh, the next on the list was Philippe Michel at the Brasserie. Um, he was at Langton's then, um, and that, um, unfortunately, uh, they were in the middle of service, so I was like, I'm not going to go in. So I headed to Toofy's because I wanted to learn about Australian seafood. That was on my list, and Michael Bakash had just finished service, and he's like, look, you're, you're English, you can only work for me for three months, um, can't do anything. Um, so then I was like... Uh, I went, my mate who I'd met, uh, Mark Prothero, uh, hosp- uh, hospitality guru, um, was at, uh, what was the Italian cafe in Melbourne called? Um, on Drummond Street, Faraday Street. Anyway, I was having a coffee with him there and across the road was Vieux de Mont. And um, that was like number eight on my list. And Mark's like, just go and say hello to Shannon. Um, he worked for, you know, Burn Ray and Marco, and I'm like, oh, okay. So I walked across there and um, walked in, and Shannon was actually making this terrine, uh, a foie gras, lentil, and ox tongue terrine that I'd, that I'd made many a time. Um, and I spoke to him, and he'd worked for Burn Ray. So my first two, my two head chefs at the different places in England and Scotland, they both worked for Burn Ray, and then one had worked for Albert Roux, and then one worked for Marco. And lo and behold, like Shannon knew of them. Uh, I got the job and started there the next day. Wow. <laughs> that, that was um, when it was in uh, Carlton in the original location. What was it like in the early days there in that kitchen? Oh, it was, I was, I loved it. Like it, we went through a lot. I think where I, I was there for three years. And I think when I left, I was like 
staff member 174 in wow. the, in the period. <laughs> like Shannon knows knew how to churn and burn. Um, um, and people just not rocking up, but um, it was just like a European kitchen to me. Um, it was long hours, hard work, you know, a bit, a bit, um, a bit, uh, a bit fiery. <laughs> Um, Shannon, Shannon knew how to give a good bollocking <laughs> and, uh, you know, he made me junior Sue and then Sue and then in, I left there in 2004. And you took on your first head chef role and, uh, received a hat not long after that. What, what was that like that period, um, uh, having only been in the country for, for a couple of years? Um, well, I think it was that one thing of realizing, um, the, the great thing that about Viewdemont was just the clientele base. There were, you know, they there was a, a group of like, you know, Shannon really heroed wine. Um, it's something that I I must congratulate him on. It's something that I've always taken on the rest of my career. That you know, wine's a really important part of the restaurant scene and just life. Um, so opening it up, a lot of those same customers came, and uh, but it, I was way too young to be. I was twenty four, a head chef. Um, I didn't know anything really about life. I didn't know anything about business. Uh, I knew how to do costings and uh, that, but not how to run a kitchen. Um, and you know, I was only there eighteen months. The owner of it, and let's just say I don't say eye to eye with him. A bit of a classic dodgy hospitality. Um, owner, he um, he loved the uh, anyway. Um, so I left there. I was, I was actually he, he he sat with one of my best mates who was running the restaurant, and I was up in uh, I was up in bloody where was I? I was up in Port Douglas, and I'm like, man, I'm not coming back. <laughs> no, like get stuff. Like no way, you're an idiot. Um, anyway, I I I actually spoke to John Lethlane about it because. Um, I was I was sponsored and I needed sponsorship to stay in the country, and the person who was one of my biggest you know, heroes and uh, you know uh, an amazing human, uh, Andrew McConnell, called me up and see if I wanted to come on board uh, to be the sous chef at um, at uh, then it was Circa the Circa the Prince. Um, he just got given three chef's hats and I think he won chef, chef of the year and the restaurant of the year. Um, and I came on board that board there. And so the head chef was David Moyle. I was the sous chef. Um, Andrew was the executive. And that was kind of like a platform of learning and hospitality and what true, uh, the Van Handels, both John and Frank separately, but also together, um, and their, their GM, uh, um, uh, 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 um, Rosanna, Rosanna, Ro- yeah, uh, Roseanne, sorry, Highland, just amazing hospitality people. And that's what, that was that real eye opener. And that, I guess when my learning really started. Tell us about the food that you were cooking in that kitchen with that team. Cause it's such an amazing alumni have come out of that, that period of time. Yeah. Well, there was, so there was John, uh, JP, so, uh, John Paul Toomey. Um, uh, there was, uh, Chris Watson, uh, Josh Murphy, like the, there was actually, there was Philip Sibley in the bloody, uh, pastry kitchen. There was an amazing thing. And it was actually, I must admit, it was, it was a really interesting side because I'd known and I'd, I'd always loved Andrew's food from the two on one days, but, but that was that element of, you know, two on one, like most restaurants of that time was small. And there wasn't that many bigger kitchens and restaurants. So there were 17 in the team, and we were doing fine dining food, free out food for 120 covers. And that wasn't, you know, that was a, that was more of a key or a uh, – so it was, it was actually really hard. And – um, the great thing that I loved about Andrew was that he was always open and he was his one thing was always about surrounding himself by really amazing cooks and people um, and that is that your life gets easier and you can all you know move forward and get better and the food but it was my first day there was like um, I'd been working during the day and I got there at three o'clock and Andrew goes oh there's the there's a section and I'm like 
you want me to do a section? I was like, yeah. So they gave me the hot section, and I still had to, I'm like, so what's prep's been done? How many's booked? And it's like, oh, it's, it's like a Thursday night. There was 90 booked. I'm like, has anyone prepped it? I'm like, no. So Morley and JP's giving me, like, JP was on the hot entree, and he's like, oh, mate, 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 you've got a fucking, fucking lot to do, hey, mate. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, never been in this kitchen. And, like the hot section at Circa at that point cooked everything. So it was all, you had to do all, all, all meat, all sauces, all preparation for garnishes, plus then functions, plus uh, the, plus Dego. And the Dego menu was completely different to the a la carte. And the a la carte was, it was four or five meats. And then there was like three or four meats on the entree. Um, it was, a, anyway, and that was just a massive eye opener of how, uh, high-end, top-end food you do, um, fine dining, and with big numbers. We had a baptism of fire when you started there, but you ended up in the role of head chef. What was it like working with, with Andrew and um, being head chef of a restaurant with, and being a bit more mature than your previous role of head chef? Well, I think that's that's where um, I think every chef goes through it in their career. Um, and at some point, you just figure out who you are as, a, as a, an actual chef and what you actually like cooking. Um, so in quite quickly, in, I started there in 2005. By 2006, uh, you know, we, we, we kept three hats. 2007, Andrew kind of departed and became consultant, and they made me a Moyley joint head chef. That was in late 2006. Um and into 2007, and then um, John Van Handel bought the Beach Hotel, and Moyley moved up there. Uh, so I was on my own, running a brigade, and you know, a lot of those the staff that were there and then were like Moyley's Moyley's humans. They weren't mine, um, so I had to really rebuild. Um, and there's a lot of complicated, you know, seven days a week, lots of other uh, food options as well. So it was it was a massive steep learning curve. And I must admit, I, it, was a, it was probably the hardest and biggest challenge mentally and physically ever. Um, I was quite angry. <laughs> I'd, I'd taken on some of the traits of my former head chefs to uh, get my uh, point across <laughs> and ask for... Uh, asking for food quite quickly um but ended up with an amazing team but it was around 2000 it was it was 2008 i just wasn't happy i realized mentally i wanted to go to this the food that I was cooking was the format of what uh, andrew's food was um people expecting this sort of food and it's just not how i could naturally cook even though i've been trained in fine dining i just i'd started all the books I've been, you know, I've been buying the old bully books and all the, all the books of the time, you know, the Calandras, the, the fine dining books of the world, the two, three Michelin star guys. And I just realized that the books I actually enjoyed reading were Stephanie Alexander's Cook's Companion and uh, the River Cafe and um, uh, Darina Allen's, you know, the cooking, you know, lessons in cooking and Alistair Little, Simon Hopkins and I, and I really struggled with what my food was and how I cook and and it just didn't feel, I feel like everything I was doing was pushing and straining to do something fine dining. Like I can remember doing this potato coil and it took fucking hours to make them and we need to do like 40 a day and I'm just looking and then it was filled with foie gras, like this foie gras mousse and with this roasted quail and quail spice and I'm like is it food, is it not? And it was at this time where I met now Charlie, my wife, uh, who was at the Melbourne Wine Festival, and I, I went to the Van Handels and said, look, I'm just not happy. Like, this is not the, this is not the food I want to cook, the journey I want to go on is I've lost complete disconnect. Um, I want to get back to it. And they said, well, what, what do you want to do? I thought, I just want to cook real simple food that's um, direct from the producer. And, and that's where it came from. I, I had to look. I had to look at where who I was as a human, like my grandfather was a, uh, a very simple, beautiful human being who loved a uh, whiskey and bread and dripping and grew all his veggies. I was a coal miner, hard working coal miner. And I looked at these things and I looked at what is truly seasonal. Um, and to me, it was only vegetables and fruit. And that's where I decided to simplicity of cooking of just letting the flavors come through of, and the amazing producers that we have in the world. And especially in Victoria, um, using them and getting a connection between them and um, food writer Richard Cornish was a real 
um, mentor through that about connecting connecting with people. I do a lot of road trips with him, meeting suppliers. And just out of it, I, I felt this confidence and I decided that instead of Australia, you know, I'm, I'm always going to be a foreigner. I've got this stupid Yorkshire accent. I go, I go back to the pub in bloody Yorkshire and every, every bugger's like, what's that stupid Aussie accent you've got? And I'm like, and they call me a fucking <laughs> like, um, surfer. And I'm like, I'm fucking like, and then I come here and everyone's like, why are you so English? I'm like, fuck. <laughs> anyway, so it's quite funny in that way where um, I decided that, you know, and this is pre-kids, that Australia is home, but more importantly, Victoria is my home. And I think I think coming out of this pande- pandemic, it shows so much more like with Federation and that I'm like, oh, fuck, I was right. Like I backed that. If anything was to, to be truly seasonally, seasonal, you have to work within the, the surrounds of you. And there was all that. You know, Paul Mathis had that hundred was it hundred mile or thousand miles or thousand K restaurant, and I'm like, I wasn't going for that. I just wanted that seasonal produce that was and working direct with the farmer. You just knew more about the produce than anything else, and that was that journey that I started. And I was very fortunate with the Van Handels that they backed me on that, and we changed the restaurant to show that. And you know, I thought I was going to go down. To, I just thought I was going to lose all the hats. I'd, I'd already bloody lost. And that's the most gutting feeling from Andrew leaving. We went from three hats to two hats. <laughs> and I thought I was going like, in fact, even bloody Andrew told me I was going to lose another hat and I was going down to one <laughs> hat. And I can remember being at the Age Good Food Guide Awards and Roseanne Highlands next to me. I am like shaking and like, like I look like I'm like about to faint. And they're reading out all the one hat restaurants. And this, what's this, 2000 and, this is 2008. And we hadn't, we'd, we'd kept two hats. In fact, we'd actually gone up 0. 0.5 of a fucking score. And Andrew <laughs> sat in front of me and turned around going, sorry. I'm like, fucking <laughs> you bastard. <laughs> anyway, the, um, so yeah, we, we redesigned Circa. And at that point, no, um, we'd, I'd been working. Sorry there, bro. Yeah. Uh, so I'd been working on, um, uh, I've been on working on quite a bit with um what's the right thing to say with um gardening and we had our own plot in south melbourne and then working really directly and we, we we i ushered in this area of that that farm to table within on 2009 uh into 2010 at circa and, and loved it and i just felt as soon as we started that menu it was just so easy to ride and so easy to cook it um and learning the techniques of how to cook into that simple way was just amazing this episode is proudly supported by Montague Plums, handpicked for you. So the eating experience of our plums is sweet. That's a primary driver. It's got to be sweet, but it's also got to have enough acid because the mix of acid and sugar is what is what gives fruit its flavour. And in a plum, it tends to be slightly higher acidity. And then um, a really nice, full, not dry, but juicy um explosion of juice into your mouth as you as you bite into it that's that's nirvana for us in terms of plum for more information go to montague.com.au well that change to be able to cook the way that you felt more natural cooking that led to um, pope joan a very influential cafe that um epitomized that kind of locally grown seasonal fare Tell us about Pope Joan. Yeah, so Pope Joan was like, so my, my mate, Benny Foster, um, my girlfriend at the time, he actually he worked with her. And we, I had some spare money, which I should have put into a house. Just uh, anyone, anyone that's listening that's young and thinks about owning a restaurant before buying a house, just think again. Just put that money into uh, <laughs> a house or use someone else's money. <laughs> like it's, I don't. Want to, it's like, please. It was supposed to be just a, a cafe that I had on the side, um, and I wanted to like open a, a, a restaurant. I actually looked at a few spaces, and I wanted to call it Hen and Cock and be this kind of like British uh, bar, kind of like Movida, but with like you know, my influences of Britain. Um, I never ended up getting it off the ground, but then I like. My, but, but my focus before that was was Pope, and I was actually still at Circa for three months, whilst I was uh, whilst I opened up Pope Joan, and I did a three month straight, 
Um, so I was doing like breakfast at Pope, then going for the nighttime service. And then after Saturday night service, I'd go and do Sunday. So I'd have like Sunday night off, really. And that was the only uh, – Sunday night and Monday night I'd have off. Uh, and it just broke me. I got too tired. But um, the one thing that ben, both Ben and I wanted from Pope Joan was we didn't want it to be the high end of coffee. We didn't want it to be the high end of food. We'd like, we wanted it just to be like Ian Botham, like a, the best all-rounder. Um, you know, a bit fun, and I, I really wanted to. I, I, you know, there was amazing cafes in Melbourne already. Coffee, food. I just wanted to do something that was. I wanted to show that you can take high end, uh, refined dining, like high end bistro, food, like we were doing at um, Circa, almost fine dining, but with singular thought process of ingredients and put it in proudest and hardest thing I've ever done was Pope Joan. Um, and in the end developers got the, um, got the space back, you know, it was a lot of bloodshed and tears, but the, it's also during the end of it, I, So we owned Pope Joan for was the end eight years. And I think through that eight year cycle and that cycle of life that like you come in and out of thought processes that I went, through two cycles of my own life within Pope. So, yeah, so the developers got the land and um, I'd been given, I would been like fighting with them to try and get some money, some bits and pieces. I'd made some bad business decisions and we'd end up in a bit of debt that I needed to get out of. But the last six weeks of cooking there, like I'd done, I'd been testing these things out, summer camp cookouts, which was just one big fire out the back <laughs> of Pope <laughs> and we ran it just through summer and it, it was it was a lesson definitely in how not to um, do uh, barbecues at times <laughs> like I have the first one I went and chopped up all, all my own wood from well it was actually Stacey from Warialda Melted Galloway brought down a truckload of a uh, truckload of uh, mountain ash uh, wood which is really bad for barbecues and it just smoked the whole area but it was <laughs> it was such a fun event and my head chef at the time I'm Jakey and um, my front of house manager Jimmy. We just worked on the menu at the end of that week. We just write down what we wanted to cook, and it was literally we wrote what we wanted to drink and eat, and then that was wow. it. So it was this real love and refoundation of what hospitality truly is, um, and it's that element of looking after people and giving. Mm. Um, and then it it all ended, and it was I decided to take six months off, and that's when I started with four pillars. Um, I'd come up with a business idea about reutilizing food waste into smoking pellets and um, salts and sugars and stuff. And I went to, I'd been doing a lot of cooking for Four Pillars anyway, and they were friends. And I'd asked uh, Stu if he was interested in hearing my business proposal. And he went, all right, tell me it. And then I start with gin. <laughs> he's, he's like, well, we don't want all the other crap, Matt. We want the gin part and you. And um, I came on board and they to look at all of Four Pillars uh, basal waste and the food side of it and just coming up with good ideas that are fun within within that's not gin. Um, and it's been that sped from, you know, making soaps, which was a really bad idea, which, Cam McKenzie, if you do listen to this, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> he said it was okay to sample some, and I ended up with 4,000 soaps on a rope. <laughs> so I thought it was a fun <laughs> idea. Um, I think they're still selling them. But um, <laughs> I, you know, I came up with some uh, ham glaze and um, work. The, the, the best two I think what we've come up with so far is the gin salt made by Olson's, which is the... Uh, byproduct of making the uh, rare dry gin and mixing it with the macrobiotic grey salt, and then with Gormo, the the great Nicholas Gorman from mm. Yarra Valley Caviar, who is a legend in himself as a producer, him and his partners, um, with what they do at, there with the hand harvesting. But during the last lockdown. Uh, Goldman and I were talking, I was able to go up and, and we tested about 36 times to get to this bloody Shiraz gin flavoured caviar, which is, it's actually wow. really amazing. Um, and it's, it's, we were, we, we tried smoking the caviar with the gin, um, gin pellets that I'd got and, and, and made. And we've ended up with this amazing product. So that was, that was like, that was like one of the highlights. And it's, it's one of the things like being part of, a different company and after mm. owning my own business for eight years and then seeing three the three co-founders that, that still run the business 
Stu, Matt and Cam I've learned so much for in the last three years they've been amazing humans to be around and watching that business grow um, you know it, a 50% have got acquired but they still own 50% of it um, it's just a really amazing business of how good uh, humans are and small businesses how different is the 25 year old um, Matt Wilkinson compared to the chef that we see today <laughs> so I think, I think um, obviously we had a year out coronavirus um, which but prior to that I'd you know I, I actually reopened Pope Joan in the city mm. and then sold that as a brand um, and it was great to see the end of that um, I then took over and went into business with Maid Establishment um, George and his partners and Crofter and turned that over and I had, I'd had an idea about what I wanted to do with food um, and I realised from this time this separation having kids being married to then taking over Montalto where I've completely taken a different process I'm, I'm a lot calmer My the way I'm looking at Montalto is it's, it's back to that thing that first thing that I learnt from Andrew is about surrounding myself with as many like-minded good people and trying to educate them through food mm. of the different cuisines of the world and that there's not just one there's not a right or wrong way the only wrong way is if it's burnt or it's off and just working together as a team um, I used to look back at myself when I was at 24 26 I was like and the the Ian Curlers and the Paul Wilsons looking you know they were that bit older than people that I looked up to and just um, and it's a, it's something I see now in young chefs, um, and I was there once myself. It's like the very ambitious, very outspoken, um, don't really know much about food, and that's something I think in the last 10 years I've really endeavoured to know about is how something's grown and the history of it mm. um, and why um, and that respect for it, and I just didn't have it when I was younger. I just um, – and I think – that's led me to be more confident now with who I who I am and who I who what the food I want to cook is, and so it it, it takes away of like using that then team and asking for everyone's voice rather than just trying to be out on your own, which I, which I was when I was young, and I think that those frustrations, the anger that people get out, um, it is your own ego, but it's just frustration that you you can't deliver on. Um, who you actually really want to be. Uh, and that's what I found now at Montalto. It's, it's such a – because we've got the four acres of uh, produce there, um, I feel like I've actually found where I am and where I should be. Wow. Um, Julie, Julie Belling at the Gardener, it's just like it's like everything that I started back at the circuit days – um, it's, I've gone a long way and different ways and through different avenues and all seen so many sides of food along my journey. But where Montalto is at is it's a special place for real, true seasonality and growing. Um, and now my job's there now is just to slowly keep working on, you know, working with smaller producers. And that's to me is where I think I'm better. Um, and I I don't have the legs anymore, <laughs> and I am definitely a lot fatter than when I first started. But I'm still good looking. <laughs> but the um, it's the, the the mental stage of my career. I couldn't be happier. Was well, someone who's come from another country and made a real success of your career in hospitality, like many um, come to Australia and do that. What, what do you think about all the different uh, countries, the representations in Australia and the makeup of Australian cuisine? Yeah, I guess it's a thing that I've been playing around the last couple of years in my head and real frustrations of the, the true love of food and the understanding of origin. Um, the true love of food and the understanding of origin. The biggest frustration I have is, and this is food writers, but it's also um, the growing of food. And because we can travel so much no, more now, is mm. we, we, we've stopped regionalizing food and the origin of elements of it. So we call Italian food Italian when the food of Puglia is completely different to that of Veno, uh, uh, Veneto or to Piedmont. Mm. Um, Parisian 
cooking is very different to that of provincial French. Um, what you're going to get on the old um, Portuguese Algarve, you know what I mean, is like very different <laughs> to the street food of Porto. But we call it Portuguese food, and we think then straight away, you know, certain spices. We think Spanish, we call it Spanish food, we call it Chinese food. Like the, the Chinese, the Ulgar, um, that Silk Road, mm. northern Chinese food is completely different to the pork mm. and the roast duck of Hong Kong. And it frustrates me when, you know, especially supermarkets and shows, and we go, oh, gr- amazing Italian food. And it's like, well, you know, I'll, I'll say especially Italian food because I do have a love for it, is the things that you get in Emilia and Romagna is very different to the things that you're then going to get in Sicily. And this regionality, and that's, we just put things together. And I think, I hope that we start to go, when we're talking about, and, and, and Melbourne and Australia, Melbourne and Sydney and Brisbane, and well, all of Australia is so multicultural, but we, we, we're pigeonholing it, and I don't think that's quite right. Um, I was I was in a Ethiopian restaurant the other day, and I'm talking about a certain food, and they're like, "No, no, you're thinking of Eurasian. It's like a different bread." And I'm like, "Oh, sorry." <laughs> um, and it's, but it's that simplicity of uh, pigeonholing that I I really hope that will be a change, and it's something that we could lead in Australia. The same conversation about talking about our own origin of food of what is Australian. Uh, cooking and native ingredients that we include the multicultural aspect of mm. food into its own region and why it was there because you go around i don't know if you've ever been around sicily um you know the, the three major cities are all very different food from one to the other you know yeah. the north part and it's it is one well, a small island but it's because certain inhabitants of certain times through history have brought that food there and it's stayed and there's a little bit of peasant element to the hills that you just don't get in the the seaside element um and that's that's one thing i get again there's there's a few books out there that talk about it um in those ways about true regionality um but it's only i think it's also just coming out of uh covid and talking and talk to people about oh I, I miss going overseas for this it's like well you, do you really miss the country because I've been to there's some shitholes in England right <laughs> right but going to the York York Moors I took my kids there in 2019 to Whitby and to um, we went uh, fossil hunting and I went to Whitby and I was like the food in England's amazing yes there's, there's this amazing fish and chip shop but I've gone and bought the most beautiful haddock and samphire and these uh Welsh onions and I and beautiful English spinach from these little girls. I'm like, that is kind of that that regional, you know. There, there is regionality in England. You know, there's a different sausage for every county. That's regionality. <laughs> um, uh, so that's that's hopefully something, that, and that's something that I'm really interested in uh, and wanting to just talk about a lot more now when I talk about and think about food. Well, I think uh, we might have to catch up with you again and dive deep into that topic because it's absolutely fascinating and something that needs to be explored. Yeah. Um, Matt, we've loved having you on Deep in the Weeds today. <laughs> I think we definitely need to catch up in, a, um, in the not-too-distant future and um, and dive deep again. Uh, please keep in touch and uh, we'd love to have you on again soon. Will do, mate. Thank you so much. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we share the stories of Australia's HOSPA community, suppliers and producers in search of hope during this pandemic. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds Podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well. <laughs>